I'm going to talk about um, anesthetic management for fetal loss and termination. Um, this is a, a great picture that I have to acknowledge. My husband gets mad when I don't acknowledge the pictures he takes when I put in my slides. So this is um, <laughs> him. He, um, we were up at the wine country, so if you guys get a chance, um, it's a beautiful place. So he, he took this picture, and I thought it, I had to put it in my slides. So no disclosures. So I'm going to talk about um, the common causes of fetal demise. Um, it's actually in the obstetric literature, and, and if you go to an obstetric conference, that's one of the areas that's a really challenging for the MFM teams because often we don't have a reason, and it's really from um, the emotional impact and kind of future planning for women. It's a really um, the MFM physicians really struggle with how to explain, you know, what could they do differently or, you know, and of course talk about the, the guilt and um, that goes along with this uh, loss. So we're going to talk about the obstetric management and then also the anesthetic options um, for induction, termination, and dilation and evacuation or what we call d &E. So just a little, um, this is a shout out to the Williams um, Obstetrics textbook. Um, so this is a um, little graphical depiction of where you see the most of the fetal deaths after 20 weeks. And generally, we look at it, it's after 20 weeks. Clearly, they happen before 20 weeks as well. We talk about second trimester and you know what, what stillbirth and what happens at that point. But I'm going to focus really on kind of the late um, second trimester um, and how we're going to manage that. So you can see it's about 50-50 from 20 to 27 weeks and then 20 weeks and beyond. Um, and then we're not going to focus on infant deaths for this talk. So I know this slide is a little hard to see. I tried to blow it up. Again, this is from the Williams text, but just really looking at the fetal demise causes. And there's obstetrical complications, and they have it by percent. And so really obstetrical complications, which are sort of generally um, categorized into PROM or premature rupture of membranes and abruption. Um, you have, there's um, obviously multifetal gestation and different issues that can happen with that. Um, and then placental abnormalities is the other big um, uh, group and that's usually uteroplacental insufficiency and if you have a maternal vascular disorder those are kind of the big ones and again um, really it's hard to know I mean we'll, we'll talk a little bit and how um, it's managed from the obstetric side but a lot of what happens with the um, induction termination or the DNA is getting tissue to really evaluate what we can do for um, the next and what was the cause. And sometimes we just don't know. So this one is even smaller, and I apologize. The main thing I wanted to point out is um, what are the various um, increased risk factors on maternal side. So hypertensive um, disorders are one of the big ones, as you can see. Um, diabetes, as we would expect. So maternal issues. Um, you know, any obesity is another one, obviously, um, breaking it up and anything greater than 30 um, BMI, you're increasing. And then uh, maternal age, which is why um, the OB groups have tended to induce patients um, for what they call advanced maternal age, and you'll see patients getting induced electively um, when they're uh, over 40, 40 and over. And then I was just going to point out, as I've mentioned in my talk before, the huge health disparities. So you're at increased risk um, being a black woman compared to being a white woman. And again, hard to know why that is, and that's a big area of investigation. So the obstetric management I'm going to talk about, I talked to our colleagues at um, UCSF in the OB group to kind of get their um, protocols that they have. As I mentioned, it's a long discussion with the patient um, when they've either, um, they either have to do an induction termination for fetal anomalies or it's, um, you know, what is expected to be an otherwise healthy pregnancy but had premature rupture of membranes or if they're, um, or if it's a, a stillbirth, so an IUFD. And so patients, you know, will be evaluated um, looking at the, um, the fetus and if they have structural abnormalities um, or if the structural abnormalities have already resulted in a fetal demise, they will um, have an indication for induction before 24 weeks. Um, obviously, PROM. And then um, another big area that we see patients transferred in who have um, some maternal uh, complication. And 
they either have such severe preeclampsia before uh, 24 weeks that if they continue, it's going to compromise their health. That's an example of, of some of the reasons we would do an induction termination. Um, there are a whole group at um, SFGH is the Women's Options Center, and we're actually one of the largest centers that does um, late second try uh, terminations for elective reasons, and so they get transferred in, and so that's a whole other um, group that, you know, they have a whole clinic for that. I'm not going to talk a ton about that. Um, more it's um, at Mission Bay, what we do at, at Mission Bay. So the patient um, in the discussion, um, we offer either um, a DNE, so dilation and evacuation, or we offer induction termination. And that um, often is patient preference. If it's before 24 weeks, we can often do, if we, we have enough skilled um, obstetric providers that we can have them, they're trained doing DNEs at that late second trimester, we can offer it to them. Some patients want to, in order to process, they want to actually do an induction termination, be able to hold um, the fetus, and you know that we offer all kinds of, even with the DNA footprints and things like that for processing. And so we have a whole group that actually focuses on that with social work, um, nurses that um, that's their area of focus with um, dealing with patients with induction terminations or, or DNEs. So there's a whole host of literature in the obstetric world about KCL and digoxin um, for fetal intracardiac injection. We do offer it really for patient preference after 20 weeks. There's no data that shows that it improves um, the DNA or makes it easier if, if they're going to have it or the induction termination. We really do it um, for patient preference. And really, that comes down to a patient. Um, real, there is, in some cases, with an anomalous fetus, that it, they could be born with a little bit of um, agonal breathing. and the the patients may decide, I, I don't want that, and so we will offer it. Um, and there's a few providers that will do it. It's in, um, they get transferred to our prenatal diagnosis center where they have like a, a ultrasound, and there is a, a couple people that will do those. And I think we have two or three um, MFM providers that'll do it beforehand. So for the DNE, um, it's considered a dilation and evacuation after 14 weeks. Before that, it's called a DNC. So um, the dilation and evacuation is something that is a multi-day process and takes a skilled provider if you get into beyond 20 weeks. And the reason for that is it can be um, very challenging to do it um, beyond 20 weeks. And so we are one of the centers because we have the uh, Women's Option Center at San Francisco General. We actually have many um, of our residents and um, fellowship trained and family planning providers who um, manage these patients both at San Francisco General and at, um, at Mission Bay. And so they can do these procedures. So we're very fortunate that we can offer that option to a patient, either the DNE or the induction termination. So if it's a DNE, um, the laminaria placement can be 24 hours if, um, if a pristone is given. And if it's, um, if it's not available or it's not given, it's 48 hours prior to the procedure. Mifepristone is an antiprogesterone, so it's RU486. So we use that because it actually helps with um, cervical preparation and, and helps speed up the process. So the, um, you need to have the procedure done after you've had at least 24 hours of cervical preparation. And we do this in the operating room. Um, we have a, one of our smaller rooms where we do our tubal ligations and we do our DNEs in uh, kind of a smaller, um, the third OR for us, and it's done with ultrasound. So the ultrasound really helps guide so that they can see where they're going, and obviously increased risks that we see when they're beyond 20 weeks are um, you can have pretty um, significant cervical laceration, you can have um, uterine laceration, and even significantly enough that it's going to affect you get uterine artery um, uh, compromise and they can bleed. Um, so they have, uh, and uterine perforation, that's the other big one. So with the ultrasound guidance, they're able to see where they're going and um, how the, if they're you know too far up into the fundal region. So it's, it's important for them to have that. So induction termination is something that is done with a combination often of mesoprostol and mifepristone. 
And for those patients, um, we have protocols where there's continuous TOCO monitoring if they're greater than 20 weeks, 28 weeks with a uterine scar, or if they have twins at any gestational age. The dosing you can see there at 18 to 28, uh, two weeks um, with single tens and no uterine scar, they're pretty, what you'll notice is the um, mifepristone and mesoprostol combination. Mesoprostol is a pretty high dose, um, much higher than we would obviously give um, if we were not doing an induction termination. Um, and what they found is that they're able to um, use those high doses to sort of, the goal is let's um, facilitate this um, induction and move things along. And mifepristone helps with that as well. So if they're not delivered after five doses, we actually have to reevaluate um, and look for signs of uterine rupture. And um, we could consider either starting again or do a DNA. And so again, we'll talk to the patient about it. And the goal for the patient is just to move this along and, and get this completed and done um, as quickly as possible. So I think one of the things is always with someone who has a uterine scar to um, proceed cautiously. Um, and we've had a few cases where um, we've, we've ignored their increasing pain and we've um, had some patients that have had uterine rupture. So we do look at that carefully. So if there's greater than 28 weeks and there's a prior uterine scar, um, we actually can see we're still giving pretty high doses of um, mesoprostol, but we dose it down. And actually um, talking to some of the providers that do these in the obstetric world, they will actually even go lower on that dose, but they can go as high as 200. I think there's um, their um, dosing is based on data that they have um, from retrospective data. In the third trimester, they're obviously going to use the lower doses and what we typically see in inductions. And then we start oxytocin anytime after 17 weeks. So it's usually um, similar to the inductions that we see for um, patients that are having you know, standard inductions post dates on labor and delivery. They will get their cervical ripening. And then once that's done, they will start with the um, Pitocin. So very similar. It's just obviously higher doses of mesoprostol. And we add mifepristone. So that's the obstetric management. What do we do with the anesthetic management? So for us, it depends on what procedure. Obviously, if it's an induction termination versus a DNE, we do different things. Um, we want to make sure that we know the gestational age. Um, we also need to ask, you know, why is this patient being induced? And determine which, you know, were you doing DNE or are we doing induction termination? And then obviously evaluate maternal comorbidities. We also, if it's a fetal demise, ask the patient um, and the providers when we suspect the time has been from the demise to where they are now. If um, the patient has had a fetal demise greater than three weeks, they're obviously now at a little bit higher risk for um, DIC, and so you can um, ask for DIC. I usually do get DIC labs if it's greater than three weeks. When the demise happened is really challenging, especially if they're early in the gestational age. Um, but you know, there's some signs that the obstetric team can look at. Um, no one ever really fully knows, so you have to kind of use your judgment. So with induction termination, um, it's very similar to a laboring patient for, from our standpoint. It's labor analgesia. We do it uh, epidurals. We really treat for maternal pain, and we tell the patient, you can have an epidural whenever you want it. Patients will often, um, in taking care of these patients, both on the obstetric side when I was an obstetrician and then from the anesthesia side, often patients try to not have an epidural because they figure, well, it's, you know, they, they think it's going to happen quicker and, you know, maybe um, I can go without it. We tell them at any point they can have an epidural, and usually what they start with is some fentanyl, and it's usually around the time that they're about to deliver um, the, the fetus that they have that increasing pain and cramping, and we put an epidural in it. It's often at that point um, they, they will deliver. The other thing that's um, important with the early gestational ages, um, the um, umbilical cord is very small, and so the placenta can often get adherent and the cord can evolve. So we try to, once the fetus has been delivered, we will wait for the placenta, and we wait, a, we can wait up to four hours. If the placenta isn't delivered at that point, or if there's increased bleeding, 
we would then proceed to doing um, a manual extraction of the placenta and um, go to the OR. And so in that situation, you have that epidural that you can use as well. And you have to be prepared with any induction termination that you may end up being in the OR for a DNC for the retained placenta. So the management for DNE. Again, you want to know the gestational age. You want to know if they're going to have the laminaria placed with mifepristone or just laminaria. Um, we obviously think about 20 weeks gestational age. That's when we start to have the concern for increasing risk of aspiration. And your anesthetic options can vary depending on the maternal comorbidities. So I always ask, is there a role for GAWA? So that's general anesthesia without an airway. Let me ask the audience. Um, since uh, I want to get a sense of, have you guys ever, in someone who's 20 weeks or greater, done a GAWA, or general anesthesia without an airway, for these patients? Okay. Good. Good. All right. So, why are we worried about it? Well, just to review, you guys are all aware of the gastrointestinal changes during pregnancy. So we um, think about slowing in, uh, intestinal transit with the progesterone. We think it's progesterone. Um, we look at gastric volumes, and they start to increase at 15 weeks. And we have uh, lower gastric pH. So obviously, if there's aspiration, it's um, a, a lower pH and more acidic. You have incompetence of the GE junction. Um, and that starts pretty early on. I mean, when I sell my obstetric patients in clinic, it's probably about at that 15 to 17 weeks, they already start complaining of GERD. And then you have intragastric um, pressure being increased. Obviously, upper airway uh, edema, we worry about that in labor, but it actually starts as early as 12 weeks of gestation. So those are all the reasons that we worry about a uh, pregnant patient being an aspiration risk. And then at 20 weeks, the uterus is now at the umbilicus, and so you're worried about that also um, producing uh, pressure. So um, if you were here for Dr. Sullivan's talk, you probably are figuring now, what the heck, let's just the aspiration risk is pretty low, so we should do it with this, too. So let's talk about sedation. So that's, um, when we talk about GAWA, um, that's the general anesthesia without an airway. But um, the papers I'm about to show you talk about doing um, these procedures with uh, deep sedation with a natural airway. So I always question the, you know, is it deep sedation or is it general anesthesia? It's a slippery slope, right? So we know the sedation and anesthesia, it's a state of mind, right? It's a continuum. So the minimal sedation, obviously patients are um, responding to normal, normally they, have, they can respond to verbal commands. Moderate sedation, they'll be purposeful. Um, they'll still have spontaneous ventilation. And this is sort of the, the, the critical part, that what's deep sedation versus general anesthesia. It really comes down to the patient um, purposely um, following repeated, you know, moving with, with painful stimuli. And there is slightly um, an increased risk of hemodynamic or respiratory compromise. So obviously, they're maybe going through periods of apnea, but they're still going to respond to painful stimuli. General anesthesia, that is, they're not going to respond to painful stimuli, and you are potentially going to see apnea. So why does that matter? Well, several papers have been published on deep sedation without intubation during the second trimester termination. The reason for that, and, and actually this is done at, at um, San Francisco General um, a fair bit. In fact, I think the majority of their patients are done at, with, with um, what they call deep sedation slash GAWA. Um, and it's because it's very quick, right? These are clinics that um, this paper was done in an inpatient. I'm going to show you another one that was done in an outpatient. They have to go through so many cases in a day that they just said it's quick, it's safe, and this is one of the papers they looked at um, this setting, and they said, you know, we've, we've looked retrospectively, and they had DNEs from 15 to 24 weeks. They did 332 patients. They reviewed the records, and they did four weeks post-procedure. They reviewed their records, which was good because they went, you know, beyond the just day of. And um, their primary outcome was pulmonary aspiration or conversion to intubation. So they defined pulmonary aspiration, so that's um, an important thing is to see when you look at these papers how they define them. It's um, development of new pulmonary symptoms um, and or chest x-ray findings. So it was pretty um, 
specific. 36% um, converted to, of uh, that group converted to an endotracheal tube um, and no aspiration. So I think um, when I look at these papers, um, part of it is I question having done these cases, you know, it's hard to know if you're fully the, during the whole case in deep sedation and not general anesthesia. So I kind of look at it and think, well, this is, um, I have to assume that some part of the procedure they were transitioning between deep sedation to general anesthesia. But nonetheless, they didn't have any aspirations. There was a bigger paper that was done. Um, Jillian Dean, who um, is the author of the paper, she actually um, trained at UCSF and then did um, her family planning uh, fellowship and went on to be the medical director. Um, she's now at New York. Um, and she runs um, a very high volume clinic. As you can see, they did a retrospective review um, over 81 months. They had 11,000 patients that had what they describe as deep sedation. Um, 365 of those patients received deep sedation after 22 weeks, um, and there was no aspiration. And the only criticism in reviewing the paper is they didn't really have a lot of follow-up after discharge, but you know, nonetheless, they didn't have any within that period of time that they did the procedure, and while they were being recovered, any signs of pulmonary aspiration. So why are we worried? You've seen this slide. Um, the risk of um, aspiration is something we worry about in our pregnant population, and obviously in this um, uh, cohort of over almost 5,000 patients that have maternal cardiac arrest, and now this is when they're um, not d &E, um, patients, we did see a uh, high 7% was um, allocated to aspiration pneumonitis. So that's the concern, right? So there are data to show that you could do a deep sedation, and I would argue it's probably a combination of during that procedure, deep sedation slash general anesthesia without an airway, and they have been successful. But it's a question of what risk benefit. You know, do I want to risk the aspiration versus is this a quick procedure and it's going to be okay and based on all of these retrospective papers. So is there an alternative? There's also neuroaxial approaches, right? So you could do an intrathecal or an epidural. The benefit is you minimize manipulation of the airway. Your patient, um, this is a procedure that I will tell you 100% um, of the patients do not want to be aware of what's going on. So you're going to need to give them some amnestic agent. You need to have a short-acting local anesthetic for um, this. It's an outpatient procedure. And obviously, in very busy clinics, you want to be able to you know, go to the next patient, go to the next patient, and you don't want your recovery unit to be um, waiting with all these patients that are you know, two, three hours after their spinal, they're still not recovered and able to leave. It does take a little additional procedure time, and you have a risk of postural puncture headache. So what are the options? There is um, chlorprocaine, which is uh, duration of the block is 30 minutes to an hour. You have bupivacaine, which is not looking so good for a quick outpatient procedure, and neither is rapivacaine. So what have I done? So chlorprocaine. Um, I was interested in this um, the very beginning, the first day, Friday, everybody was talking about things to put into the intrathecal space, and I was like, that, oh, maybe they won't be so uh, freaked out by chlorprocaine. Um, it's been an issue. So why was it an issue? Now, Ken Drasner wrote this. He's, um, from, he's now retired, but he was um, one of the leading experts on local anesthetic and wrote this editorial back in 2005. And the issue with chlorprocaine was the preservative. So the take-home point, um, and I encourage you, it's a great um, editorial review, it's a great article, but the um, chlorprocaine, the upshot is, it's preservative-free, it has no bisulfates, um, it, it acts as a local anesthetic that is short-acting, and it ha doesn't have any risks of TNS. And so how do we know this? Well, the, one of the authors of this review for neuroaxial anesthesia for outpatients, he's at Virginia Mason. So Virginia Mason has, they use it um, pretty frequently in their outpatient for ortho procedures. They will use chlorprocaine. 
They've done uh, 4,000 cases. Um, they've had no evidence of nerve damage. And they use 40 to 45 milligrams of anesthetic um, for 60-minute procedures, and they have 120-minute discharge from the PACU. They use it. I've talked to um, Dr. Mulroy about it, and he is, he's said they've, that that's sort of one of their exclusive things that they do for these quick cases. Um, it has been approved in Europe um, for intrathecal injection, and the discharge times are shorter um, compared to lidocaine. One of the things that there's been plenty of studies on this have shown that you um, don't really need to make it hyperbaric, so you don't have to add dextrose to it. Actually, when they've done that at Virginia Mason, they've had more urinary retention, and since they stopped doing that, um, they've, they've not had any issues, so they just use the two chlorprocaine. Here is a review um, of the chlorprocaine spinal retrospective analysis. And so they had 121 patients receiving preservative-free to chlorprocaine for spinal anesthesia, no report of complications of TNS. You can see the recovery profile there. Um, that's um, chlorprocaine really um, from the time that they're able to um, ambulate and be discharged. It's of the three different local anesthetics. It's um, the one that provides the quickest recovery. So um, I do use chlorprocaine for procedures on uh, labor and delivery, d &Es. I will do it for cerclages. Um, it is a great local anesthetic technique for patients that want to be discharged. You need to have that block. It will last, in my experience, you have an hour. So you always want to ask your um, obstetrician, do you think this procedure is going to go longer than an hour? Because if it is, then you can't really use chlorprocaine. But it is an option. So the management of these patients, it's a complicated and emotional um, process for the patients. It takes a multidisciplinary approach um, to manage it in a way that patients feel um, they're being treated in a respectful, dignified way. and I think our patients are really respectful of the whole process. We, um, we do provide whatever anesthetic management that we can but based on the patient's um, preference. And for the DNEs, um, you can consider doing some short-acting local anesthetic for those procedures as well. And obviously, I would urge to use some amnestic somidazolam. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. So we'll wait for the panel. Thanks.